Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, we'll be it will be hosting this in English because it's an international crowd. And um, then I think I'll just begin by saying uh, a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, some people will maybe dropping in the next couple of minutes. My name is Nina Norman and I work at the Fossil Free Aviation 2045 team at RISE. And I will be facilitating today's meeting. And I will just very shortly go through the agenda and some practicalities. And then I will leave the floor to Maria who will introduce Mark. Um, we'll take some questions after Mark's presentation or actually during Mark's presentation. He will have a few blocks in his presentation and you may ask questions and then we'll take a few stops in the presentation and take the questions and you may pose questions by either raising your hand and the way you raise your hand is in the menu you will have a, a participants a choice and you find your own name and you click on raise your hand and i will facilitate the questions or if you have problems, problems seeing that, you can also use the chat function and write the questions in this chat. And I will get to those. All right. Um, after the questions, we will have what we in Sweden now call the digital coffee break or digital fika, uh, which we decided after our uh, last meeting because we feel that people have, um, they have a need to talk about things and that will be pretty um, informal and I will moderate that too. So after the meeting is done, you're very welcome to stay in the meeting and we'll just continue with the FICA after a short break where you can go and get your coffee. So please join us for that. Um, I think that you are probably, you're pretty good at muting your microphone but everyone, uh, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking, because otherwise we can hear you. So we have a few people who have not muted. Um, the questions uh, we have talked about, but uh, when you do talk, talk, please um, introduce yourself, uh, present yourself with your name and organization when you talk for the first time. Thank you so much for that. Um, so then I will just leave the floor to Maria for her introduction. Hi, um, as you probably know, I think I have actually met most of you. Uh, my name is Maria Fiskerum and I'm the cluster manager of the Fossil Free Aviation 2045. And I must say that this is a day that I've been waiting for, for several years actually to learn more about the ASTM process and I do think there's more people on the call as well that's been waiting for it because I do think this is a very important piece that we need to get production up and running both there, here in Sweden in the Nordics and I know also some of you are from Europe uh, so we hope that you will bring us a lot of good knowledge today, Mark. And I met Mark during um, the conference, the IATA conference last fall in New Orleans. And already then we talked about this meeting. And I'm so pleased that today is the day when we will hear you speak. So Mark is the regulatory and technical expert from the Federal Aviation Administration and he's been so for over two decades. And also what makes it so interesting is that you have actually been on the task force that developed the ASTM standard D7566, the standard that we talk about when we talk about sustainable aviation fuel. So with um, Nothing further, I would like to, to leave the floor to you, Mark, and really, really looking forward uh, to your speak. And I would also like to say to all of 
the others on the call that I'm very pleased and happy that so many wanted to join us. And I hope that this could be a small puzzle uh, by, or what you say, piece of the puzzle. So we will have production soon here in, in the Nordic, Sweden or Europe. Thank you and welcome, Mark. Thank you and uh, good afternoon and good morning. I'm uh, actually located in Boston, so it is uh, morning here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen right now. And uh, you get to see my email. So I am uh, I'm Mark Rumizen. I work for the FAA. Uh, I am what's called the Senior Technical Specialist for Aviation Fuels in the FAA. Um, uh, I'm part of an organization that an industry frequently companies call these position technical fellows. It's a similar type of role uh, at the FAA. Um, I'm uh, part of an organization called CAFI, uh, Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative. And that's a government industry coalition. And our, we were formed in the mid 2000s to promote the introduction of aviation, of alternative aviation fuels or sustainable aviation fuels. So we've been working on that um, for uh, uh, over, over a decade now. And, um, uh, and we've had a lot of success. I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, but there's a lot of aspects to trying to introduce alternative aviation fuels. There's commercial, economic, environmental, uh, and there's also a safety aspect. And my focus is on the safety aspect. Um, so this presentation will focus on how we evaluate candidate alternative jet fuels or alternative sustainable aviation fuels to make sure that they can safely be used on the aircraft. And uh, there, there's always a lot of questions about how do we approve them? Why do we work through ASTM? Uh, why isn't there a direct government approval, for example, by the FAA or EASA in Europe? And hopefully by the time I'm done with this presentation, that will all be clear, hopefully. Um, so uh, let me get started. So this, this chart is, is an overview, and I'll use this as sort of a, a framework for the entire presentation. Um, so um, when an aviation regulatory agency approves a new airplane or, and or a new aircraft engine, we certify those aircraft and those engines. And we don't approve the fuel, the aviation fuel. What we do is we certify the aircraft or engine um, to use a fuel that the aircraft or engine manufacturer specifies that the aircraft must, must use. And we call this an operating limitation. So again, we, we approve the aircraft, we approve the engine, and GE or Pratt & Whitney or Rolls-Royce or Airbus specifies what fuel needs to be used, and that's the aviation fuel operating limitation. And typically, or historically, in, in pretty much the, the, the non-Chinese and Russian area of the world, it's always been at A1 fuel. And that can be defined, that's simply defined by specifications. There's different specifications around the world that describe Jet A or Jet A1 fuel. There is someone on the call, sorry, but there, there is someone on the call with their mic on. Uh, if you can please mute it. It's still someone that have some noise behind them and are unmuted. Okay, let me, let me continue. If it gets too loud again, you, you can interrupt. Um, 
so as I was saying, um, uh, aircraft and engines are, are approved by aviation regulatory authorities like EASA and FAA, and it's the same. Um, the fuel is approved as an operating limitation. So we don't have direct authority over the fuel because the fuel is a, is a commercial commodity. It's, it's something that industry controls, and I'll get into more detail on that. So that's step one, is that the aircraft and engines are approved to operate on a fuel, which is called Jet A or Jet A1. Um, so uh, we have, so what we decided was because industry specifications control the aviation fuels, they define its properties, that we needed to work through these industry organizations such as ASTM or the, the, the British uh, um, Aviation Fuels Committee um, to uh, work through those organizations to define a means or a way to introduce alternative jet fuels. So in ASTM, we developed a, a qualification process and, it's, and the standard number is D4054. And, and that basically lists a bunch of tests and requirements that a candidate alternative jet fuel producer needs to conduct in order to show that their fuel is jet A fuel, that it has the same properties, that it's the same fuel. Uh, so the whole intent of D4054 is to describe testing to prove that your candidate fuel, your candidate alternative fuel, is essentially the same as jet A fuel made from petroleum. And then what we did was we developed a separate jet fuel specification for our drop-in alternative jet fuels, and that's D7566. Um, the reason we had to do this was that we, and I'll talk about this later on toward the end of the presentation, was that the primary reason is we wanted to have tighter or more stringent controls on the alternative jet fuels. They had to be better, better quality, more tightly controlled than jet fuel made from petroleum. So we needed to have a, a separate specification with additional criteria, additional tests you had to run to make sure every batch of your alternative jet fuel was, was, was good, was, was very tightly controlled. So if you go through the evaluation process, D4054, and if the data shows that your fuel is essentially identical to jet A fuel and has the same properties, then we will put that, can, that, that fuel, which is typically described by a conversion process in feedstocks. Uh, for example, Fisher tropes produced from syngas or HEFA produced from free fatty acids and fatty acid esters we will put that into the drop-in fuel spec as a new annex. So now we have a collection of alternative jet fuels, um, each described by an annex. <clears throat> and the reason we have the annexes is that, um, is that they describe very specific and stringent requirements that must be met. And then you have to blend typically 50% of that alternative jet fuel with conventional jet fuel. And there's reasons for this because uh, uh, um, many of the alternative jet fuels are compositional subsets of petroleum derived jet fuel. So in order to make them completely identical, you need to mix them with conventional jet fuel and then, and then the composition is complete. Um, and the other reason is that the aviation industry primarily the aircraft and engine manufacturers and the regulatory agencies like the FAA and EASA, we want to be conservative and we want to uh, slowly introduce these fuels into service and not um, allow a, a completely 100% pure alternative jet fuel until we have sufficient service experience on airplanes to be sure that, that, that they can be scaled up and commercially they can be made safely. So we require blending. Step four is, um, so we have these two, we have this specification, we have our drop-in fuels in the specification. And what we did was we put provisions, wording, in, in both the drop-in fuel specification and the conventional fuel specification, which is D1655, to cross-reference them and say, 
if to, to, to allow to say, if um, your fuel meets the drop-in fuel specification, then it also meets the, um, the conventional fuel specification. So with that wording, what that means is that all the aircraft and engines that have been certified and approved by the aviation authorities to operate on Jet A fuel to ASTM D1655 can now also operate on fuel meeting D7566 because fuel meeting D7566 can be re-identified as D1655 fuel after it meets all its requirements. So the process that brings you all the way around back to the original aircraft that have been certified. So this whole process can be described very simply in that if you make a fuel and it's proven to be identical to the existing jet A fuel made from petroleum and it gets added to the drop in fuel spec, you automatically are grandfathered or already approved to operate on existing aircraft and engines. So that, that's why when one of these new pathways, is what we call them, gets added to the drop-in fuel spec, it's an approval to fly. Because it already meets, when that happens, it meets the existing approved operating limitations on all the aircraft and engine out, engines out there. So that's, a, uh, that's an overview of the process. And I'll go into more detail on each one of these four steps throughout the presentation. Um, Nina, perhaps we should maybe see if anybody has any questions initially. Um, many of them I may just say we'll talk about it later on, but maybe if someone has a general question now. Mm -hmm. um, I can't see any questions at the moment. Does anybody have a question? You can either write in the group mm -hmm. chat or you can, um, you can raise your hand in the participants uh, menu. No, Mark, I think you can go on. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to give an overview of all of the um, uh, pathways that have been approved to date. And this just gives you sort of a timeline of how long we've been working on it, but also of the success we've had. Um, one of the biggest challenges when we started all this back in 2006 was thought to be the getting approval of these new fuels by the Aviation Regulatory Authorities. Uh, when we formed CAFI, uh, that was the biggest concern that because uh, you're getting approval by FAA and EASA is always very difficult uh, because we are so concerned with safety that uh, many people thought it would just be a bureaucratic and a regulatory uh, roadblock to getting these fuels approved. Yet over the last decade, and I'll go over this now, uh, we've approved um, seven of them. So we formed CAFI in 2006, as I said, and I don't have any slides on CAFI, but CAFI is, the, is sort of a repository. It, it's a coalition so it's a repository for information on alternative uh, aviation fuels. So if you have any questions, I recommend you go to www.cafe.org, as you can see it up in the right-hand corner. There's a wealth of information on there, many other subjects which I do not talk about because I'm not a specialist in them. As I said, the economics and environmental issues, feedstocks, um, many, many other things, how to work with airlines to, to um, how airlines should work with fuel producers to set up contracting agreements. There's all sorts of information on CAFI. All the contacts are listed there, so you, you can contact people if you have questions and uh, wealth of information. But anyway, that was formed back in 2006 because it was recognized there was no voice or advocate for aviation fuels, for, for alternative, for renewable aviation fuels. There, there was a lot of um, media interest. There was a lot of political interest in ground transportation fuels, renewable ground transportation fuels, but not in aviation fuels. And that's why CAFI was formed. So over the years, in 2008, we issued our drop in fuel specification, 2009, I'm sorry, our drop in fuel specification. And at the same time, our first conversion pathway Fisher Tropes 
was added as the first annex, Annex A1. Uh, then very shortly afterward, we issued our, our, our qualification process that I talked about, D4054. So those are both available on, on at ASTM. You can purchase those from ASTM.org um, or you can join ASTM, get, get, get the documents. Um, and then we proceeded over the years to evaluate, and these are very rigorous evaluations. They typically take several years, cost a lot of money, a lot of testing. And over the years, we've approved uh, several annexes, A2 in 2011, a3 in 2014 and 2015, uh, A4, and then alcohol to jet, um, uh, SPK in 2016, and then 18 alcohol to jet. Um, we, uh, it was decided to limit, limit initially by just the feedstock isobutanol, one type of alcohol. We've expanded that to include ethanol and isobutanol, but these are, this is sort of a, an example of some of the debates and discussions that go on when we try to uh, develop these new annexes about how we define how they're controlled and what the limitations are on. So in this case, we were limiting it by the type of alcohol. Uh, Annex A6 was just issued in December. That's ARA, um, CHJ fuel, catalytic hydrothermolysis. And, um, and actually, I should mention, um, another annex just passed, um, and it should be available from ASTM. It should be added to the drop-in fuel spec probably next month in May, and that'll be Annex A7, and that's for um, IHI, this fuel, which is called HC-HEFA, hydrocarbon-HEFA. And it's very similar to HEFA, but the feedstock includes hydrocarbons. So that's not on this chart, but that should be out shortly. So let's look at um, step one where I talked about the jet fuel operating limitation, the, the basis of why we can approve all these fuels. Um, so this is an example or an excerpt from an aircraft flight manual. And you'll notice down on the bottom, these are just the words that say from the aircraft manufacturer, you must use jet A fuel to ASTM D1655 or jet A1 fuel. Now, this is just one example. Most aircraft, if you look at an Airbus or a Boeing aircraft, or, or most of them all now include um, Jet A1 to DEFSAN 9191. They'll include even Russian uh, TS1 fuel, Chinese number three jet fuel with the specification numbers, but they define what fuel you must use on that airplane. That's called the jet fuel operating limitation. This this is just a, um, a graphic of the jet fuel, the ASTM conventional jet fuel specification, D1655. A specification has a lot of criteria in it. It has properties that you must meet, and that's called table one, but it also has other wording in it that you must, must meet. And this explains why you can't put renewable aviation fuels into this specification, because it has wording that says, where the fuel, what the fuel must be made from. And it must basically make, be made from fossil sources. Such, it must be derived from uh, hydrocarbon, petroleum, um, uh, crude oil, natural gas, heavy oil, shale oil, oil sands. So it says that right in the specification. So you cannot, even if you make a fuel that meets all the properties in the specification, and if you make it from, um, you make it from uh, lipids or you make it from vegetable oils, it will not meet the specification because it's not made from crude oil or, or a fossil source. So that's the reason we needed to have a separate specification for the renewable jet fuels. And, and as I said, this specification and all fuel specifications will have a table of properties. These are physically prop, physical properties that, that when you test the fuel, it must, must meet it. Um, this is how you manufacture the fuel and, and can make sure that each batch of fuel is acceptable for use on airplanes. This is an example of the properties that are in um, pretty much all of the Jet A fuel specifications. If you went to DEFSAN 9191, this is taken from ASTM D1655. 
Uh, and many countries have their own fuel specifications. Japan has their own fuel specification, Brazil. And actually, I'm not sure about Sweden, but I, I think you may have your own fuel specification also. But they're, they're typically based on the ASTM or the, the uh, DEF stand 9191 specification. And these are fuel performance properties. There are some compositional properties up in the top left, you'll notice. An important one is aromatics. And, but every, and then you'll see a bunch of other what we call physical properties, such as distillation. You just heat the fuel up and measure uh, how much of the liquid condenses at different temperatures. Uh, freezing point's very important. As you can imagine, uh, the jet fuel gets very cold when airplanes go up to high in, high in altitude. So the freezing point is minus 40 degrees, and that's actually C or F, it doesn't matter. Um, that's very important, viscosity is important. Net heat of combustion up on the top or right under combustion, that's a measure of how much energy the fuel has, and that relates to the range that you'll get when you load the fuel on the airplane. Um, other important, uh, thermal stability under stability, jet fuel thermal oxidative stability. Um, very, very important because the fuel also gets very hot in the airplane as it goes through the fuel system, goes into the fuel system. And if it's not thermally stable, if it doesn't meet this requirement, it can form deposits and clog the fuel system. And then your engines will shut down. Um, and then contaminants and additives. So every batch of fuel has to meet these properties. Now, the interesting thing is that these properties force the final jet fuel into a sort of a compositional range because you have to have a certain mix of different hydrocarbon compounds in the fuel to meet all those physical properties. And so the hydrocarbon classes are isoparaffins, normal paraffins, cycloparaffins, aromatics. And for example, just a few examples, I mentioned the freezing the freezing point is a very low temperature at minus 40 degrees C. If you have too many normal paraffins, you won't be able to meet that freezing point uh, because normal paraffins sort of stack together more nicely and, and they will for, start forming a gel or a solid at a higher temperature. Whereas if you have isoparaffins, isoparaffins because they're branched, this relates to the structure of the molecule, they don't fit together as nicely and, you ha and, and they, they will withstand freezing to lower temperatures. So a jet fuel, that, would, that would force a, a producer to, to have more isoparaffins in their fuel. The reason this is all important is that, is that when we approve these sustainable alternative jet fuels, we look at the composition and we look at it at the molecular level and make sure that it looks like what a typical jet fuel would look like. And this is what a typical jet fuel would look like. And, and as I said, all these different components are important because they allow the jet fuel to meet its properties. And then therefore they allow the jet fuel to operate safely under very demanding conditions in an airplane. So you have a physical prop, you have a specification that defines the physical properties. The physical properties drive you to a, a compositional range, and that's what you copy when you make an alternative jet fuel. And what this means is that when they first designed um, jet engines back in the 1950s, really, when they first started making them in volume, they, they designed the engines to operate on an existing fuel. And the fuel available at that time was kerosene. It was widely available. Uh, nobody knew, they, they couldn't really sell it. There wasn't really a market for it other than lamp oil. And that was going away because of electricity, obviously, by the 1950s, certainly. So the first jet engines, they designed and optimized to operate on kerosene. And then, so they developed a specification in 1959, which is the ASTM specification, D1655, that started gradually adding more and more properties as jet engines were being designed to this existing fuel to better control it, because the jet engines got uh, more sophisticated. Um, the, the, they, they had more demanding operational requirements. They were flying faster, higher, longer ranges. So the, you had to keep adding properties to the fuel to 
to more tightly control it. So over the decades, jet engines were designed and operated to this specification so that they're, I mean, optimized. So you had a situation where you had an existing fuel and all these new engines were designed to operate on it. Um, and there, there are elements, and I sort of talked about this a little earlier, you know, that these engines, it's important to control these properties because these engines depend on them, the design of aircraft engines. Um, just a couple of examples. Um, as you might imagine, when you spray the fuel into the combustion chamber, you have to atomize. It has to be a very fine spray so it ignites properly. Things like the freezing point, the viscosity, the distillation, the surface tension, which is not controlled in spec, but that's a very important property. They all have to, they, it all, the, that you have to have acceptable properties for the fuel to form this fine spray for the engine to operate. Uh, fuel pumping, uh, viscosity is very important. If the fuel's too thick, it won't pump through the fuel system. Uh, density is important to meter the fuel so you can control it, um, control your fuel system to get the right performance. Um, I mentioned thermal stability is very important for uh, to prevent deposits forming and blocking your fuel system. If the fuel gets too hot, if the fuel gets too hot, or if the fuel cannot handle the heat in the fuel system, you'll start breaking the bonds, and it'll form active radicals. They call them, and they'll they'll start finding each other and forming deposits, and and, and start building up on the metal components and block the fuel nozzles. And as I said, you can your engine can shut down, or you can get a burn through. Um, Emissions, there's different aromatics influence emissions, sulfur influences emissions. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through all these, but an interesting one on the upper left, handling safety. Uh, flashpoint is very important. That really was originally driven by the military, by the US military using jets or jet aircraft and aircraft carriers, because they were very concerned if the fuel um, uh, would spontaneously ignite as the temperatures got hot at too um, low of a temperature, you could have a fire. So now there's a flashpoint requirement that says that the fuel cannot, it must have a flashpoint greater than 38 degrees C, which is 100 degrees Fahrenheit, I think. So that, that what that means is that um, any temperature above 38 degrees C, the fuel can self-ignite, but most of the time you're below that temperature in normal operations. So you won't worry about getting an explosion or ignition of the fuel. That's handling safety. It has nothing to do with the aircraft or engine operation really, but it's more for handling safety. Um, so, so the engines are designed to, um, to operate on this composition of fuel and fuel those properties. Uh, any questions before I start block two? <clears throat> yes, we do have a question from uh, Charlotte. Um, do you have a prize for the first question, or I thought you were going to give a prize? <laughs> um, uh, let me think about that. I'll see what I can do. Um, Charlotte uh, Merstadt, um, you can post your questions now. Okay, let me... Um, trying to figure out. So I should... Uh, let me get out of full screen and then. No, no you can, you can, you can keep that. I, I can, I'm, I've unmuted you, Charlotte. Okay. Yeah, okay. sorry. I was just having some issues uh, with the, <laughs> I had okay. this, this other noise going on in the background. But, All right. Uh, so please, uh, please present yourself so we know who you are and what organization. Yes. Hello, I'm uh, Charlotte Meerstad working at NLR, Netherlands Aerospace Center. Uh, also on the topic of alternative fuels for aviation. And I was just wondering uh, whether the session today is uh, about drop-in fuels, which is of course uh, very valuable for the near future, or whether we will also be discussing non-drop-in fuels, uh, which would require engine reconfiguration or other well, propulsion that, systems. Yeah, I mean, um, th that is a good question. I didn't mention this. When we formed CAFI in 2006, we decided that we would um, limit our efforts to just drop in fuels. And the reason for that is there are perhaps 10 to 15,000 civilian commercial aircraft. I'm not sure if that's the United States. It's probably just the United States. Um, 
And these aircraft typically last for decades. I, I mean, you'll have a, you, you buy one of these aircraft, uh, you know, an Airbus 350 will be around for the next 30 years. Um, so you have this huge accumulation of very, very expensive assets that, as I said on the previous slide, are designed and optimi optimized to operate on a certain type of fuel. And it would be um, extremely, it would be virtually impossible to try to modify that existing fleet of aircraft, all of them to operate on a non-drop in fuel, a, different, a fuel with a different composition or different properties. Um, and then economically, um, economically, if you design, if you created a non-drop in fuel, let's say you, you figured out how to make a better fuel, which is possible, um, there are things you could do to make the fuel better, um, but then you would have to find aircraft that could use that fuel. So you'd either have to start modifying a, a small number of aircraft or you have to design and build a new aircraft. And you can imagine the market for that new fuel would be extremely small because it would be extremely expensive, first of all, to modify aircraft because you have to first do the engineering work, then you have to build the parts, and then you have to have it certified by the FAA or EASA or the regulatory agency. Extremely expensive. And so economically, it made more sense to drive or force the candidate renewable fuel producers to make a fuel that was identical to the existing fuel so you didn't have to modify the aircraft. And I will mention that we have had been having some discussions with uh, designers of supersonic aircraft. And because there's initiatives going on now to, to introduce new supersonic aircraft. And they're very concerned about the environmental impact of these aircraft because obviously they use a lot more fuel. So one way to mitigate that environmental in impact is if they could operate on 100% renewable fuel. So you, you would mitigate, they're burning more fuel, but you would mitigate the carbon emissions because it would be renewable. Um, and, and in that situation, if they were to do something like that, you could imagine supersonic aircraft flying from a very few select number of airports where you could develop a small specialized infrastructure or supply chain that could provide a unique fuel for those aircraft. But, but in general, it'd be because so much jet fuel is used on the existing aircraft, it's something like 90 or 95 billion gallons a year. Think about it, 90, 90 billion gallons of jet fuel a year is used. And there is this massive supply chain that's designed it's all designed to move this one fuel, this Jet A or Jet A1 fuel through the system. So it's a very efficient system and it'd be very difficult to set up a second supply chain and distribution infrastructure for non-drop-in fuel. So we have been focusing only on drop-in fuels for all those economic reasons. But as I said, for supersonic aircraft, you if they ever come to fruition and they're ever approved and introduced, you may see a specialized fuel for them but it would be a very localized type of, type of situation. Okay, thank you. Charlotte, did that answer your question? Yeah, we have uh, another question. Yeah, did the answer need why, um, why we are discussing it? Okay, thank you, perfect. <clears throat> we also have another question mark from Yirki Laitila. Hello, Jurki Laitila from uh, Finnish Transport and Communication Agency, Traffic or more, we are Finnish CAA also. Um, I have one question concerning these annexes. Uh, there is a uh, lot of research in uh, power to liquid uh, fuels, and I'm not completely sure if it's uh, included already or do you need a new annex for that? Um, I have had some conversations, I believe, with a company in Germany, I think, if um, I can't remember the name of the company right now. Um, and the, uh, the conversion uh, concepts that have been presented to me um, involve the production of a synthesis gas of uh, hydrogen and carbon. So I believe they use the electricity to, to convert the CO2 to the synthesis gas. 
And if you read very closely Annex A1 for Fisher Tropes, it is worded such that you must start with a synthesis gas and then convert that to a liquid fuel using the Fisher Tropes process. So the annex, Annex A1, does not care where you get the synthesis gas from. Historically, with Fisher Tropes, the synthesis gas could come from uh, coal, by conversion of coal to uh, synthesis gas, or it could come from biomass or uh, uh, municipal solid waste, which is primarily biomass, or other renewable materials, or even natural gas can be converted to synthesis gas. Any one of those sources, therefore, can be used to make Fisher Tropes fuel, including these power to liquid concepts, as long as they produce synthesis gas as an intermediary product. As I said, you can go read Annex A1 very carefully, and you'll see that, um, that they can then, they will meet Annex A1 because they're starting with a synthesis gas. And anything upstream of how they get to the synthesis gas does not matter. So I believe that the quick answer is that Annex 1, A1, it would probably, my understanding is that uh, you can make power to liquid fuels and they would meet Annex A1. But you need to look at it closely to make sure. All right, thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you. All right, we, uh, we have a couple of other questions, but we only have 15 minutes left on the session. So I think that we'll oh, leave the questions to the end so that everybody can see the presentation and then people can stay for the questions if they're able to. Yes, I'm sorry. I, th I think I find I talk more if I'm just sitting here at a desk rather than giving a presentation. So let me try to accelerate. Um, uh, okay, we'll do the block two. Uh, so when we make drop-in fuels, I talked about this. The difference is you have to work backwards. You have to make the fuel fit the existing fleet of, of engines and aircraft. And we call it backwards compatibility. Um, and, and that's the challenge with these fuels and that's the approach we're taking. I just kind of explained that before. So the D4054 evaluation process uh, involves a lot of testing, tier one and tier two or fuel properties testing. After you do, after the fuel properties testing is done, um, the, the company will put all the data into what we call a research report. And this is all done through ASTM. We have a group at ASTM of OEMs, an international group. It's Airbus and Rolls-Royce, as well as GE and Pratt and & Whitney and Boeing. And the FAA, I'm part of it. And then EASA participates sometimes. We even have Embraer now. And other companies, um, and they, um, they review the data. And two things come out of the review of the data. First is, does it look like a viable candidate renewable jet fuel or alternative jet fuel? And secondly, um, we've looked at it, and then here are the tier three and tier four testing you must do to complete the evaluation process. This is more expensive testing. It involves a lot more fuel. And it involves using rigs, for example, combustor rigs, fuel nozzle rigs, and it also may involve engine testing. So it's much, much more expensive. So you have this phase one review to, to, to make sure we define what the next step is to try to control the cost and, and, and help out the candidate producer so they understand what testing they have to do. That testing gets completed. A final research report is issued. There's another review by the OEMs all done sort of within ASTM, but it's a, it's, a, it's a separate little team. And then FAA review is done pretty much at the same time. Um, and after all that, then the candidate fuel is proposed for balloting in ASTM, where the rest of the membership gets to vote and, and decide whether or not an annex will be added. And this is important because the other members of ASTM have a wealth of experience in the aviation fuel subcommittee on making jet fuel. So they, they have a perspective from the distribution system, a perspective from production that the engine and aircraft manufacturers won't have. So they evaluate it. It goes to the ACM balloting process. All, every step here is iterative. I didn't mention that. You know, phase one, phase two, and the balloting is all iterative. You may have to go back and get more data, have discussions, create more data, issue report addendums. Finally, if the balloting is successful, a new annex gets added to the drop in fuel specification. So that's a process, very rigorous, a lot of data. It's all designed to prove that the fuel looks 
and performs the same as petroleum derived Jet A and Jet A1 fuel. And if it does, it gets added to the drop in fuel spec. Um, this is a status of where we are. And this chart used to be a lot busier, but we've just approved a couple of the fuels. I'll, now, uh, just real quickly, so uh, start from the left, and this is the same chart I just saw in the previous slide. I just moved it around and expanded a little. You start from the left, go across the bottom through phase one, and then up across the top through phase two, tier three and tier four, and then circle back around to the ACM balloting process. So I'm going to work backwards and show you the status of the fuels. So we've had now six annexes complete the process. They've been issued, they've gone through this whole process. Um, and as I said, the seventh one will be added in May. Ah, okay. <laughs> the seventh one will be, it just passed, it'll be added in May. Um, working backwards, going back to tier three and tier four, Viron uh, synthesized aromatic kerosene is having some troubles. The, the company was bought out and they've been reorganized and then they were bought out again. So they've been sitting up there for a while. We're waiting for them to run additional testing on engines and combustor rigs to get more data. Um, uh, HFP HEFA is what was called green diesel. It's basically a small percentage of renewable diesel that Nesti uh, from Nesti from Finland actually, and a few other companies in Boeing were all interested in trying to get approved. That's been going kind of slowly because some challenges were revealed for it, and we're waiting for them to get more data. Um, but that may start up again soon. But it's kind of stuck there at the end of phase one. Um, Swedish biofuels, another relevant example. Um, they've been off and on talking to ASTM. They've sort of restarted their effort. They have a draft research report and we're working with them to try to get the data um, uh, in the right form, the right type of data, answer some questions before we give it to the OEMs for a review. So they're, they are advancing, but slowly. And then a newer uh, candidate, Shell, IH squared, is a uh, fuel that is sort of um, like a pyrolysis type process where they heat up uh, municipal solid waste, woody biomass, heat it up and, um, and uh, re reconfigure it in something that looks like a jet fuel. Uh, they have um, they've completed their tier one and tier two testing and we're in the process of finalizing the research report and that should go to OEM review shortly. Um, then we have many companies that we, we have exploratory discussions with. They, they come to me and ask questions. They come to other people at ASTM or involved, and they're trying to understand whether or not they want to invest the money to develop a jet fuel. And here's where CAFI is very important because CAFI will help guide them because CAFI's goal is to, um, is to promote the introductions of these fuels. And uh, CAFI is, is a coalition. It's kind of a volunteer coalition. There's no membership. It's not, it's not a, organization in the true sense of the word, it's more like a coalition. But we all are volunteers and we group together and try to help these companies and give them guidance and advice. And two of those companies, and this is sort of a graphic metaphor here, they're, they're, conden they're condensing and coming down from the clouds in the form of raindrops and they're almost starting tier one and tier two, uh, global bioenergies and vertimass. And, um, and so we're talking to them and they're starting to gather data and they may be entering tier one and tier two soon. So, so that's what the status looks like. So we have a lot of activity. As I said, we've approved seven in um, a little over a decade and we're very proud of that fact. And we have several more that are in process and we hope to be approving new fuels every year or two and add them to the list. And then they go off and figure out how to commercialize and, and you know, scale up their operations. And I know, and then uh, co-processing, that would take me a few minutes to explain, but uh, very quickly, co-processing is um, really an accommodation to allow the production of renewable, renewable diesel, renewable diesel. Um, that's because some of the renewable diesel molecules will get mixed in with jet fuel, a very small amount, um, trace amounts, and because of that, we had to establish um, requirements in the, in the jet fuel spec for co-processing, but it's really not intended to make renewable jet fuel. 
it's intended to accommodate making renewable diesel. But I mentioned that there just because there may be questions on it. Uh, okay, moving on to step three, that's the annexes and the set. And so um, we started at seven, uh, 7.30 in my time. So we only have like eight minutes left. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, uh, so this is the, uh, and we have requirements in this new specification for drop-in kits. Uh, and we have the annexes to control it. I'm just going to go through quickly. There's seven annexes. There's unique criteria in each annex, very tightly controlled. Um, we add a new annex each time we have a new conversion pathway. And um, we have additional properties after you blend them. So it's very tightly controlled. That's the message here. And we have blending percentage limits, as I mentioned earlier, that you cannot go beyond. Um, more stringent requirements. Um, and then step four is very simple. We just have wording that cross-references the two specs that says if you meet 7566, then you meet 1655, which means you are the same jet A fuel that airplanes and engines have always been using. So it meets your certification limitations and you can use it without any, without going to your regulatory agency or anything. It's the same fuel. <clears throat> and this explains that graphically, that whole concept. So what we wanted when we started this process was tighter control of these new fuels, of these renewable jet fuels. But we didn't, we also wanted to make them seamlessly enter the distribution infrastructure. We didn't want to have to track them separately because when you move 90 billion gallons of jet fuel through pipeline, pipelines and trucks and barges, you don't want to have to have separate batches of renewable jet fuel. It's just too difficult to tra track. <clears throat> and we don't want to recertify airplanes and engines. So the way it works is you make your fuel to D7566, you issue a certificate of analysis, which says this fuel meets 7566, I tested it, it meets all the requirements. And then you re-identify it as 1655 fuel. And it goes on its way through the distribution, uh, through the supply chain with no separate tracking required. It goes to the airplane and it can get put on the airplane without any need for um, uh, recertification. So that's why everything was structured the way I just explained it in all those previous slides. So I know I finished up quickly there. Um, hopefully uh, it gives you an understanding of why people say you just go to ASTM and get your fuel approved and then you can use it on airplanes. That's why. You don't need to go to EASA. You don't need to go to the CAA. You don't need to go to the FAA. You just need to go to ASTM, and uh, ASTM is an international organization. I mean, it's, it is American-centric. I understand that. Uh, but we work very closely with DEFSTAN, the UK MOD, and their Aviation Fuel Committee, um, and they, they will accept any fuels we approve in ASTM. So the idea is to support the global fuel supply, uh, supply chain with these renewable fuels. So I guess we have a few minutes for questions, and I'm getting tired of talking. So. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mark. Yes, we do have a, a few questions. Um, David, uh, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm David Hill from uh, Fly Green Fund. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to ask if you know anything about those tests that has been done flying on 100% of uh, stuff and a Boeing has done them and Saab as well um, without any modifications to the engines. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a, a couple answers to that. First is that uh, the easy answer is that one of the new fuels that's just been approved, Annex A6, which is ARA's CHJ fuel is what we call a fully formulated fuel. It, it includes all the components, the same chemistry as petroleum jet fuel. So that means it would be very easy just to use 100% of this Annex A6 fuel. You wouldn't need, there are no questions about that. You could, um, engineering, for, from an engineering perspective, safety, it would work just fine. But because we wanna be conservative, 
And because there is no great supply of this fuel right now, we initially limited it to 50% that you needed to blend it with conventional jet fuel because we want to get more service experience before we increase that percentage. That's the easy answer. That's only Annex A6. The other annexes, as I mentioned, are compositional subsets of jet fuel, which means in the case of uh, the good, easy examples are Fisher Tropes and HEPA, Annex A1 and Annex A2. They are purely paraffinic fuels. They don't have aromatics. And um, initially, we believe that you needed to have a certain percentage of aromatics, at least 8%, to support uh, proper elastomeric seal swelling and sealing in the aircraft fuel system. Because the, the rubber or the elastomeric seals react with the fuel and the aromatics are important and an important part of that reaction. So if you don't have aromatics, the seals won't swell as much. And when you switch fuels, you may get fuel leaks. So, um, and, and, but that really only applies to older aircraft. There's a certain type of seal that's more sensitive to aromatics. It's called nitrile, nitrile rubber seals. So, so what Boeing is doing is they were flight testing um, a half a fuel at 100%, which, which was not blended. So that meant it looked just like jet fuel, except it didn't have the aromatics. So we understand what the difference is. And they were trying to determine if there was gonna be any leakage. And the answer is probably on newer aircraft, there would not be any leakage. The seals would be just fine. Uh, and in, because they've actually moved away from using nitrile rubber seals on newer designs. So the answer is that technically, in the case of Annex A6, there's no questions. You could use the fuel as a purely synthetic fuel. In the case of Annex A1 and Annex A2 and probably Annex A5, um, you, you probably could use 100% of the fuel on most aircraft without leakage, but on an older aircraft, you'd probably get some fuel leakage, which could be very serious. That could lead to a fire. So, so there's some difficult questions there about whether or not you could introduce 100% half or 50 uh, Fisher Tropes. Um, you know, you, there's several questions to be answered, but uh, FAA is funding some more research to do some more investigation on that. So uh, quick answer is it's not impossible, but there are technical questions we have to be very sure about before we allow it. And with the CHJ Fuel Annex A6, we simply need more experience. If, if ARA or other companies start making a lot of Annex A6 fuel, we can gradually start increasing the percentage from 50% to 75%, even to 90%, and eventually maybe to 100%. <clears throat> Great, thank you. All right, we're actually out of time, but I was gonna ask you, Mark, if you would, are you able to stay a few minutes? Because we do have a few other questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm obviously not going anywhere. Um, okay, <laughs> great, thank you. Uh, so the next question is from Sarah Wilkin. Hello, Mark, it's yeah, Sarah Wilkin from Fly Green Alliance here. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, I'm actually not sure about the terminology here, but what I heard about at the last IATA meeting was the um, hot house. Is that the right terminology? Hmm. To that doesn't sound familiar to me. What was it? What's the concept? Or, or so the concept is is that if you have a new pathway, there are certain oh, parts. Oh, of fast, the fast, fast track. Fast track. Fast track. Sorry, I know I've got hot house. Maybe it's warm right now. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so just wondering which parts um, does it, can it accelerate and has there been, been any producers that have gone through the fast track currently? Yes, yes, the one we just approved, Annex A7, which will be available next month, um, went, took the fast track process and we managed to get that done in a little over a year, which was fantastic. And yeah. um, the trade-off is that they're only going to be approved at a 10% blend percentage. Um, and it was okay. this company, IHI, and, they're, and I guess, sadly, they were in a hurry because of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, 
they wanted to be able to fly their biofuel, but of course that's been canceled. So now they have more time, but, but no, they, they use the fast track and the fast track provision, it, it was a provision uh, added to the D4054 qualification process. Because what we found were that um, th there, there's a compositional range that jet fuel has to meet. And, um, and the farther that a candidate fuel is from that compositional range means we do more testing and we look at it more closely. It doesn't mean we won't approve it, but it just means that, um, for example, if, if the mix of the molecules, like I showed on that bar graph on slide three or whatever, if that's a little different, if you have more cycle paraffins than you have isoparaffins, we'd be a little concerned because we don't have a lot of experience with that. So we'd want to do more testing. So we do the full testing, tier one, two, three, and four. But if someone came forward with a jet with a with a candidate fuel that at the molecular level looked just like jet fuel, or even a subset of it, like a paraffinic, just a paraffinic version. And the key is that it has a good carbon number distribution, that you have a, a good mix of uh, a range of light to heavy molecules, which allows them to burn uh, well throughout the whole flight envelope. And you have a good mix of the right types of molecules. You have the right number of isoparaffins, you have the right number of normal paraffins, and cycloparaffins. If it looks just like a jet fuel at the molecular level, we knew we didn't have to do as much testing. So because of that, we worked with the OEMs who are very, very conservative. So you should be happy about that the next time you get on a Boeing or Airbus airplane. They're very conservative and they don't want to take any chances. And they, they finally agreed, they said, okay, if it looks like a jet fuel at the molecular level, we can reduce the amount of testing required. And basically just tier one and tier two and a few other really, uh, um, a, a compositional analysis to show that it looks just like jet fuel, tier one, tier two, a few other properties, no engine testing, no rig testing. So it's a lot, it's a lot uh, cheaper, more inexpensive. You can get it done a lot faster like IHI did. And, but you, the trade-off is again, we only approve you with 10%, then you can go off and get service experience and then perhaps we perhaps we start by percentage. That's called fast track. Fast track. Yeah, sounds like a, good idea to me. <laughs> and, and IHI was very successful, so we're very happy with that. Yeah, good, thank you. All right, next question is from, Ru <coughs> excuse me, Rune Dahl Andersen. Yes, hello, thank you. Uh, Rune Dahl Andersen from Wind Denmark. Um, my question is, uh, you told us about the approval process in the ASTM D4054. Um, specification where you have your approval process and then you add an annex to uh, the approved um, fuels. So my question is, say I produce a jet fuel which uh, by the way it is described in annex A1, the uh, fission traps pathway for instance, uh, then I have a specific, specific fuel. Does that specific fuel also have to be tested in some official capacity or can that just be used because it already lives up to the annex. Yeah, another another very good question. Historically, the way the aviation fuel industry worked was that we have a specification, and and of course we were only dealing with petroleum companies, so it was well understood. And if a petroleum company made a fuel that met the properties of that specification they didn't have to get any approval. ExxonMobil didn't need to get an approval. I don't know if Nesty makes uh, petroleum jet fuel. I'm sure they do. They didn't need to get approvals. They just make it. They self-certify it. They put uh, what's called a certificate of analysis, verifying that the fuel meets the properties in the specification. And the specifications then become more of a uh, legal contract where if a big company like ExxonMobil sells a batch of jet fuel to United Airlines and ExxonMobil signs off that that fuel meets the specification, and for some reason it doesn't, and United Airlines has, let's, you know, let's say the airplane doesn't crash, but let's say they, an engine blows up and you lose a multi-million dollar engine, United Airlines would go and sue 
uh, ExxonMobil and say, you signed off here and you said this fuel met the specification, but it didn't. And here's the specification, they bring it into court and they sue them. So it turns into a more of a legal contract, not a regulatory document. And it's very hard for people to understand because in aviation, everything we do, the FAA and the ASA and the regulatory agencies oversee everything. But so it's very, it's, it's a very new concept. It's difficult to understand that with aviation fuel. No, the regulatory agencies don't check the fuel. We, we have no oversight over it. It's between the fuel producer and the airline. And so these renewable jet fuels get into your question finally. Uh, a company, any company can come in and say, I'm going to make Fisher Tropes fuel. I'm going to issue a certificate of analysis and I'm going to test it. I'm going to go to an independent lab. It meets all these properties. I'm going to follow everything in the spec. I'm going to make it from synthesis gas and follow everything in the spec. It meets all the properties. Here's my certificate of analysis. It meets D7566. And then I'm going to put another certificate of analysis on top of it saying because it meets D7566, it also meets D1655. Then I'm going to go to an airline, United Airlines, and say, here's my Fisher Tropes fuel. It meets all the specs. Do you want to buy it? And United Airlines, perhaps. 20 years from now, it's a yep, and they would just buy it. But today they're more careful and they'll do due diligence and, and you know, make sure the fuel meets the spec and everything else. Today, everybody's more careful, but hopefully it will get to the point where it's treated as a commodity and there is no approval, there will be no approval. So the answer is there's no approval required of specific companies, but if that specific company tries to sell the fuel to an airline today, because it's such a new industry, there will be due diligence and checking conducted by the customer, the airline, to make sure it's safe. Because obviously they're flying hundreds of passengers around and they don't want anything to happen. So there will be extra scrutiny, but there is no regulatory requirement. There's no approval for the company to make the fuel. It's a good question because when I was dealing with the Japanese, when we were trying to work with them on IHI and getting ready for the Olympics, they had so much trouble understanding that. I had so many emails and so many telephone calls going, Mark, who has to approve the fuel? Mark, who approves the fuel? I'm kind of like, well, nobody really approves it. You've just got to, you self-approve it, and then you reach agreements with the airline that's going to use it. And they had so much trouble understanding that. So it's a very, very good question. But, and, and again, hopefully someday in 20 years, it, it will be routine, but it is not routine now by any means. All right, thank you. All right, we have two more questions. Uh, the first one, I don't have a name, but uh, just a number, but it's a question about the approval of green diesel. Yes, it's from me, Martin, from NISA. You hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, good. Hello, Mark, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about the, the green diesel uh, earlier. But could you elaborate a little bit more on uh, when do you think it could be uh, possible to get approved? Yeah, a long time ago, I, I stopped giving uh, dates or predictions on when these fuels would get approved because um, you must remember that it is what's called a consensus-based process. Yeah. You have to get uh, people from many different companies and organizations to all agree that something's safe and then you've got to get all the members of ACM to vote and say that they agree with the fuel. So there is no one authority who's giving orders to, to make things move along quickly. So um, that's the general answer. The specific answer on green diesel is green diesel presents some challenges hmm. because green diesel is what what is being proposed is that it's right at the heavy edge of the jet fuel compositional range because diesel is a heavier fuel than jet fuel. So what that means is you have a lot of questions about cold flow properties. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it when uh, countries have tried to introduce biodiesel, which is very different from these renewable jet fuels that, that has a different composition. So that's another thing. Don't confuse biodiesel with, with biojet fuel. But when biodiesel is introduced, um, there were many problems with the fuel uh, freezing or gelling at cold temperatures uh, because it was it, it had um, it was different properties, it had a different chemistry. And the renewable diesel is right at right at the edge of the jet fuel range, so it's heavier. So there's concern about cold flow properties. Um, 
and it would be only be a very small percentage. I mean, we're talking maybe 5% of uh, an Arctic diesel cut would be acceptable to blend into jet fuel. So there are some more technical questions. Boeing is a big proponent of it because they think there would be a, a wide use, use of it, and SC is also involved. There are still some open technical questions when we're trying to work through it. Um, I guess the answer is it, it could, hmm. yeah. if the technical questions yeah. get answered and if a few yeah. other renewable diesel companies start participating, it could move reasonably quickly. But when, when you mentioned the five percentage, is it because of the composition of the diesel or is it because of the co-processing the diesel? Well, let's not confuse co-processing. Uh, uh, H HFP HEFA would not be co-processing. HFP HEFA would be where you take a, um, a, a separate batch mm. of, of renewable diesel and you take a, a little cut of it and you test it to very stringent requirements before mixing it in with the jet fuel and then test it again. Um, it would only be 5% um, because uh, you're worried about uh, the diesel forming crystals or uh, solids in the jet fuel as the jet fuel starts getting colder. That's one of the primary concerns. Um, so you could not put too much in. And you could only take the lightest portion of the green diesel and mix it in with the jet fuel. So um, it would not be a very big percentage. I, I'm sure of that. Um, oh. Percent, maybe 10 percent, but um, you know, the, the, the challenge is you'd be mixing, uh, so, so with all the other annexes we've approved, the freezing point is the same freezing point as jet fuel, minus 40 degrees. Hmm. Green diesel, what they're proposing is a higher freezing point. So you're mixing a small percentage of fuel with a freezing point of, let's say, minus 10 degrees with a minus 40 degree jet fuel you'd be concerned that that would affect the freezing point of the blend after you mix it. So there's concern about cold flow properties and that's, that's a challenge. So, so again, there'll probably be more testing required, um, but, um, and I really can't predict when it would be approved. It, would, it depends on if Boeing and Nesty, and I said another company has recently expressed interest in getting involved. I think it's a US company. Um, and then if you have more people involved, uh, you have more resources to make fuel and do more testing and maybe it would move along quickly. But I think in general, there's some more testing required um, and we need some more resources to support that, to push it along. All right, thank you. All right, we have one last question from Pedro. Um, hi, Christina. Hi, Mark. Could you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, Hi, good yes. afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for uh, allowing me to, to the question here just before the end of the presentation. Thank you, Mark, for uh, sharing all these insights. I work for a company called CHC Helicopter. It's one of the largest uh, helicopter companies in the world. We provide search and rescue and uh, passenger transport oh. services, primarily to oil and gas, but uh, um, we do all sorts of uh, services across the world, Brazil, uh, Europe, primarily. We're, we're based in the U.S. I was wondering, it's not a technical question, but I was wondering, uh, we're, we're starting now to look very closely at sustainable um, sustainability and you know, in terms of fuel. Do you, are you aware of any um, um, helicopter OEM or operators that have um, successfully um, um, embraced um, uh, renewable uh, jet fuels? Um, so could you, could you share that? Because you mentioned Boeing, you mentioned Airbus, you mentioned some of the US airliners. I would be very grateful if you could, um, if you could point out about any helicopter operator that has done that or manufacturer. Yeah, so it is it is good to have an operator listening. You know, most of the audience I think were people interested in making renewable fuel, so it's good to hear someone who would actually use it uh, listening in. <clears throat> um, so no, I really have not um, heard or dealt with any uh, rotorcraft operators who are interested in using the fuel. You're right, initially it was all the big OEMs, Airbuses, Boeings, GE, Pratt & Whitney. More recently, uh, the NBAA, the National Business Aircraft Association, has gotten, in, gotten interested in <clears throat> promoting sustainable aviation fuels. So all of a sudden, we've got a lot more interest from Pratt & Whitney Canada, uh, Turbomeca, 
um, uh, Gulfstream, for example, they're not rotorcraft, but but the, the, the smaller engine operator uh, manufacturers and aircraft manufacturers are starting to get more interested. Um, so, uh, and they have somewhat different concerns and they can be involved in the process and ask questions and vote negative if they want to. Um, so they're getting involved, which is good. Um, but recognize the supply of this, these type of fuels is very limited now. It's been mostly related to just demonstration type uh, programs where Lufthansa flew a bunch of flights between Hamburg and Frankfurt. And um, you had Boeing doing some demonstration flights and Chicago, they flew some airplanes out of the airport. But no, it, we don't have a lot of volume of this fuel. Now, you know, there's really not a regular production source. So um, you can imagine that if the, the small amount that's made is gonna go to the big airplanes, for the marketing and publicity type uh, opportunities. Um, there's no reason a helicopter operator like yourself could not start talking to some of the fuel producers and start for start by doing some demonstration operations where you pick an airport or a location and you fly for a month using sustainable aviation fuels and you can advertise it and market it. And you know it's important data because uh, we don't have a lot of experience on rotorcraft. Um, and then you, it would make sense for you to work with your OEMs. I don't know, I assume you use a lot of different varieties of helicopters, but um, you could partner with Pratt Canada or Turbomeca, Bell Helicopter or... Um, um, Pete Martin, Sikorsky, yeah. Yeah, Sikorsky, and, um, you know, which would be good to involve the OEM and have some sort of demonstration. Uh, I'd recommend you start by going to the CAFI website, CAFI.org. Um, we have other people, um, Real, uh, but ironically, you're right. No one really related to small rotorcraft operations. I was going to say we have people from A4A, which deals with airlines in the United States, so they're not going to be much help. But, but you can still probably get a lot of information off that. And if you need help with the OEMs or whatever, I could try to help you. But um, and then you could go to the um, uh, there is this an association for rotorcraft, right? It's the what what is it? The Helicopter um, Association International (HAI). Yes, actually, I gave a presentation to the, in Montreal uh, mm -hmm. to them uh, probably about six years ago in February in Montreal. So it was, it was quite, a, quite an effort by me to do that because it was snowing and extremely cold, but even for Boston. But uh, no, I did give a presentation to HAI, right? That's uh, right. Yeah, actually, they gave me, I have a coffee mug from them. So, so I did give, it, was, it was one of their meetings, and I did give a presentation on alternative jet fuels back then. Um, so they'd probably be a good place to start. Start working with them and, uh, and the OEMs, and um, then you would have to take the initiative to find someone to provide the fuel and, and do start doing some demonstration flights, but it's a good way to get started. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, we do actually have two more questions. They keep dropping in, and we'll just continue as long as you don't say, I need to go, Mark. Right, but I'm on overtime now. Did I tell yeah. you that? My, I know. My are higher, so I... <laughs> okay, well, we can negotiate after this session then. Well, um, we have one question from Maria. Yeah, it was actually not a question, but Pedro, I know some, at, uh, for example, at Calsta Airport, we have the ambulance helicopter, and they have been using the same fuel, and since we have had sustainable aviation fuel there, I know they use them. And I think we have similar situations both at, uh, for example, Arlanda and, and I'm quite sure Avinor might have some examples as, as well uh -huh. as Fedavia. So if you want, you can contact me and, and I can see if we can help you with some examples here in the Nordics. Where, so you, you can talk to some helicopter. Much appreciated. I'll put my email address on the uh, chat form. Okay, I'm, okay. Uh, thank you very much. So, and we'll try to help you with contact. Thanks to make it. All right, and then we have uh, a, the last question then from Karna. Uh, hello, Mark. Good afternoon. Do you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, there are a couple Can of... Can you present yourself, please? Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I am from Chalmers University of Technology. Uh, yeah, you just mentioned there are different fuels. Uh, they have just passed the certification process, and uh, among them, FT co-processing and 
HC HEPA process. Uh, they have just passed the certification. Could you tell me how much percentage of those fuels can be blended with the jet fuel? Um, which which conversion uh, pathway was this? Uh, you said FT co-processing and HC. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, so co-processing is different um, with the renewable jet fuels we you have to make the renewable jet fuel and then you blend it after that's made you have a finished renewable jet fuel blending component and you have a finished jet fuel and you mix them together <clears throat> and you have a certain you, you're limited to 50 percent in some cases with co-processing you take a renewable feedstock for example vegetable oil and you mix it with crude oil at the front end of the process um, before you make your final diesel, final jet fuel. So you're mixing it with crude oil and that limit is you can only mix up to 5% of the renewable feedstock with the crude oil. And then you run it through the refining process where it gets hydro processed um, or goes through food cat catalytic converter it gets, goes through a fractionation or distillation process and the final product gets split up into jet fuel and diesel fuel. And some of those renewable molecules, uh, most of them will end up in jet fuel because vegetable oils are typically heavier oils. So you'll have heavier renewable molecules and they'll naturally end up in the jet fuel cut when you go through the distillation. <clears throat> some of those molecules may end up in the jet fuel. Uh, but it'll be a, typically a trace amount, if any, and it can't be more than 5% because that's the feedstock that you mix is 5%. So, so it's different because it's mixed at the front end of the process with the feedstocks, but it is a 5% limit. But it's not measured at the end. You don't measure it when you make your final diesel product and your final jet fuel product. Does that make sense? Yes, Mark. Yes, thank you. And how about the uh, HEPA, HC HEPA. Uh, uh, HC HEPA? Yes, uh, I, uh, I just found you have said it is also just passed the test. Yeah. Of, uh, yeah. It's called HC HEPA. Um, uh, that stands for hydrocarbon HEPA. Uh, yeah. That will be Annex A7. Exactly. A7. And that can be blended at up to 10%. Okay. But, okay. but be, be, be careful. Don't confuse the blending percentages for the D7566 fuels with the blending percentages for the co-processing. Yeah, Stuart, I understood. Thank you so much. But they're different. Okay. All right, then. Then I think that that was actually the last question. Uh, we will go on to uh, Digital FICA uh, after this, but first of all, I would like to thank you so much, Mark. Um, all of these questions, we went almost half an hour over time, so I think that um, your time and presentation was greatly appreciated from uh, the whole um, network around fossil free aviation. Um, and I don't know if you have the time to take a digital FICA with us. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to understand. So, so everybody's just going to be on Zoom and you're just going to... Yes, we'll just have an informal... I'll, I'll, I'll um, host it in the same way. Just, you know, we'll uh, talk about uh, whatever people want to talk about. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I'll get a cup of tea and I can, I can listen in. I'll be All back. Right. Cool. Back in a minute, and I'll all stop right. sharing right now. Okay. okay. Well, thank you. Thank you anyway from from all of us. And then uh, let's let's all get a cup, cup of coffee, and we'll meet again in uh, seven minutes of five past three. Then, and you can all um, you know uh, mute your phones and or your uh, cameras also while you go. Uh, get your coffee. See you in Thank a few you. minutes. Thank you. You're welcome.